So, we have been looking so far at uh, the last class at least, we have looked at some acceleration techniques, we have looked at uh, preconditioning the unsteady term for 1D Euler equations, okay. There are uh, some more acceleration techniques that we need to look at, some of them are relatively uh, straightforward ideas that come from uh, things that we have seen so far, ideas that we have talked, discussed so far, okay. So, I will just use that. I will just use that to introduce uh, at least two other techniques, fine. And uh, maybe I will suggest a problem that you can try out for yourself for one dimensional flow. Maybe write out the quasi 1D equations, right. I will just write it out. I am not going to derive them. You can derive them. You have already seen them derived in gas dynamics, but still you can derive them. And then if uh, time permits, we will get into a larger class of right, a, a larger algorithm which will take me multiple classes to at least two classes if not three classes, right, to talk about uh, acceleration schemes of other nature, of, of another nature, okay, fine, okay. So, first let us look at, uh, we will just go back, look, I will write the equation in delta form, I will write the equation in delta form simply because because as always I forget the delta t there. I write the equation in delta form simply because I know that if this term were not there, it would become the explicit scheme, okay. So, if I write the equation in delta form and I am going to use this to just mention, to point out two ways by which we can accelerate convergence, okay. And the reason why I am talking about this is I want you, to, I want you to get a flavor of the kinds of things that you should look for when you are writing your code. Right. You say yes, I, last class I said I want the wall clock time, the time that it takes for the answer to come back to be as quick as possible, as short as possible, the duration to be as short as possible. So, in, towards that there may be effort that you make, various type, various kinds of things that you do. When we, I write this delta form simply because we use this argument saying that when I get to the solution, R the residue will be 0. Okay, so, I will repeat that argument. So, as a consequence as long as this is not singular delta q will be 0, okay. And therefore, it really does not matter when I get to convergence, if I am interested only in the steady state, we are no longer tra talking about the transient. If I am interested only in the steady state, then I can pick this matrix in some form so that it is easy to compute. Is that fine? Right. And we have used this argument before. We came up with the LU approximate factorization. There are other schemes that we have talked about where you can actually replace this by something that is, that is going to get you to the solution faster. Let me just put it that way, okay. Is that fine? Now, if r goes to 0, delta t times r is 0, okay. So, one obvious thing that you can do, right, and think back to the demo. What did I do in the demo? In the demo, I took, I set delta t by, I picked delta t by delta x. I did not, I did not pick the CFL. My delta x is not changing, therefore my delta t is not changing, okay. Already when I do this, you know that if my delta x, the intervals were not equal in size, you already know that the delta t will also change from point to point. But I have picked a fixed delta t, I did not pick a CFL. But you could pick a CFL, you could pick a sigma value, you could pick a sigma value, okay, you could pick a sigma value. So that it will turn out that the delta t is not same from point to point. In fact, you can ask yourself the question. So this is at some point. This is at some. Uh, this is of course a system of equations. But at some point, for any point, if you were to take a delta t, right? So if you had, uh, let's just pick a bunch of grid points here. So you could pick a, a delta t here which is different from the delta t at the adjacent. So, you could have a delta t p and a delta t p plus 1, is that fine? So, the time can be changing from point to point. This is called local time stepping. So, what could be the potential issues? What could be the potential problems? Well, we do not know if it will converge to the right solution, right. Again, I would expect 
that anybody who studied mathematics uniform convergence and all of that, we have a problem. We already know that we are not, we do not have uniform convergence and we are starting to do funny things like this. We are saying well, if there is a spot where the solution converges more rapid, very quickly to a solution, steady state solution, let it go. Why should it be held up by something that is going at a small rate? Am I making sense? Anywhere where I can take large time steps, let me take large time steps. Where I am constrained to take small time steps, I will take small time steps at those points. Is that fine? So basically what we are doing is by doing local time stepping, we are saying geographically point to point in the domain my solution is, so it is no longer if I say first time solution at first time step, solution at second time step, solution at third time step, not really a solution. It is not, I mean I do not, I cannot even imagine it as a candidate solution. It is basically well some state vector q at the first time step, whatever that means, right. But I say first time step, I do not say at delta t. My language is already changed, I do not, I say first time step, I do not say at delta t. It is not at delta t, 2 delta t, 3 delta t because I am not anyway bothered in the transient. So I do not care. And if it gets to a steady state solution that I want faster, my experience, my, my experience has been that you do get to the steady state solution faster. So if I am looking for the steady state solution, I am likely to do local time stepping, right. In my experience, uh, you do get there faster. So I am going to do local time stepping. Am I making sense? Okay. So this is one possibility. So what I did in the demo, now see once you introduce language, we have to make sure that the vocabulary is complete. So this is local time stepping. What I did in the demo is called global time stepping, right, just as a contrast. So global time stepping. You have to be careful because if you switch from one to the other or you are making a presentation where both are there, you have to have clarity. This is local time stepping, this is global time stepping, right, okay. Is that fine? And obviously there are things that you can do in between. There can be places where you say get to the steady states quickly. There may be places where you are interested in transient. I do not know, right. There could be combinations that you could use. There could be a strip where you use global time stepping and a strip where you use local time stepping. There are all sorts of possibilities. Is that fine? Okay. That is one possibility. The other thing, remember I want to get only two, I only want to get to the steady state solution. So we talked about fancy things that we could do to this, we approximate factorization and so on. But there are simpler things that you can do, okay. How many terms does the flux Jacobian have? Flux Jacobian is A. It is a 3 by 3 matrix. You can imagine if the problem was in 3 dimensions, if you are solving the 3 dimensional Euler equation, it is a 5 by 5 system. The expressions are not, I mean they are okay, but they are not that great, right. They are pretty expensive to calculate. So then I ask the question, do I need to calculate it at every time step? I only care for the steady state. Do I really have to recalculate this A at every time step? Would it really hurt if I kept it constant for a few time steps? Am I making sense? Okay, so I can take, I can, I can take the attitude, I am only looking for the steady state. It is pretty close to the original system. I will just keep A constant. And this can clearly be done, this can be clearly done whether you are doing LU approximate factorization, whether you are doing local time stepping, they can all be done together. It is not that it is one or the other. So one of the things that you can do, of course remember that the first three elements are 0, 1, 0, I mean that does not cost you anything, right. It's only, right? So I, I am not saying it is 9, but still in the case of, in the case of a three dimensional flow, I, I am to, to make the sale, right, I am telling you that I am pushing the three dimensional, three dimensional flow you will have three flux Jacobians. Each of them are 5 by 5 matrices at every time step, at every grid point. You have to calculate 25 into 3, right, 75 minimum. Am I making sense? So the question is do I need to do it at every time step? You do not. You can keep A constant, okay. So you can keep A constant, then the issue is for how long can you keep it constant? We have typically found, well it depends on the uh, flow conditions, uh, you know about 10 time steps, it depends on how rapid the transients are, but you are looking for the steady state solution. So in 3 dimensional flow, I am not really talking about two, one dimensional flow, you can try it out for one dimensional flow and see if it makes a difference. That uh, you keep it constant for about 10 time steps, 15 time steps, that the savings are quite large. 
okay the savings are quite large so you could keep a constant remember that means a is not varying in time a still varies in space okay a is not varying in time a held constant where this n is something that you determine is that fine and very obviously very obviously this n may be small if you now see now a little wrinkle on the little wrinkle on that very obviously the n may be small when you are starting off but as you get closer and closer to the solution q is not changing much so a is not changing much right so it can actually be kept constant for a longer and longer period right and as q converges a will converge is that fine okay so and uh, remember all of these can be done whether you do L U approximate factorization all of these can be done simultaneously okay so i think see this is the deal the, the the argument started with just the simple idea r goes to 0 i have my solution and my objective is to drive r to 0 no you, you we are just using that one fact we are just using that one fact right and then trying to see what is the so what's the other degrees of freedom that we have the minute i say oh this can be anything the minute i say this can be anything see that's a degree of freedom then you can say oh it can be an optimal thing then you can start hunting for optimal okay is that fine is that fine okay this is uh, this is as far as i want to go with respect to uh, obviously these arguments go on if you want to do a transient dual time stepping and all you know all of these arguments uh, take place go on to that only thing is in dual time stepping case the delta tau will change from point to point okay so all of these arguments whatever we have done here will go on to uh, that case also again as i said you could also do preconditioning the unsteady term right it doesn't you can do local time stepping pre this a whole host you can you can use a whole host of these tools right to make your code run faster to get the solution i won't say to make your code run faster see that's a very straight to get your solution back quickly okay which is your objective to get that solution back with you is that fine okay right so what i want you to take from here is not just this not just this but that the process the logic that i gave you okay that's what that's the important thing that i want you to get out of this right, the process that i've gone through okay that's the important thing so i i preserve the r and then i don't really care about the others as much and i use that to get my speed up fine okay now what i'll do is i have talked about a whole bunch of uh, mechanisms by which we can uh, uh, solve one dimensional flow let me suggest a test case for you i'll just in case on when i did the demo i didn't really point out the details of everything that i was running let me give you the specific details of what i was running so that you can try it out yourself so the length of the pipe that I used you can take it unit length if you want to start with so it can be 1 meter to start with ask yourself the question whether the dimensions matter under what circumstances do the dimensions matter okay it is a critical question that and to help you ask this question I am going to pose an auxiliary problem because we prescribed p naught and t naught there do you remember the conditions that i prescribed at the stagnation condition stagnation point p naught was 101325 pascals t naught is 300 kelvin you can start this off this way here of course we have 84000 was what i had picked pascals and to set the initial conditions so i don't i'm not going to write it here as a boundary condition remember the problem that we picked the valve we decided the valve was at the the valve that's opened is at the inlet so this condition uh, i gave it as 300 kelvin right so the in, in the condition in here is whatever is here 
So the initial condition, so this is initial condition T equals 0, 300 Kelvin Pa and then you can decide how difficult or how easy a problem you want to start with. You can take U equals 0 indicating that the flow is stationary. So in fact when you open this suddenly what you get is not, you will get a shock and you have to apply for the to find to actually calculate the propagation speed you have to use the rankine huguenot condition that we were talking about the other day, you will actually get a shock, okay. So there are various things that you can do, you could set this, you can, you can raise, I have taken a ratio of about 1.2, right, if you, you can keep the ratio at about that value and raise the whole datum up. So this could be at one, 1 atmosphere, this could be at 1.2 atmospheres see what happens, right. This is at 300 Kelvin, do you think it will make a difference if I change it to 500 Kelvin, right. Is the problem more difficult to solve if it is at 1000 Kelvin? Ignore real gas effects, I am not telling you to take into account real gas effects. There are, once you start getting to 1000 Kelvin, your CP value changes, CV value, you know gamma changes, all of these things change, so we do not, we do not want to go there. You can still keep it at Euler equation, but the question is: Does is there a change? That is there is there is it more difficult to solve? Is it easier to solve? Okay, because I've already pointed out. Why did I pick this ratio of 1.2? Because this gives me an answer that is close to 0.5, Mach number 0.5. So this gives me an answer that close that's close to Mach number of the flow. It's close to 0.5. So that my so that my eigenvalues. are all in a nearby range, okay. The problem is well behaved. So this is the other thing. So I, this process that I have gone through, this process that I have gone through to set up the problem is important. There is a reason why I am explaining this to you. So you may not, you may solve some other problem at a later date. You may be working on some, right, research problem or an industrial problem. Somebody gives you something, you are doing the analysis, you want to develop code to work on that problem. You want to test your code while you are going through the developmental process, pick an easy problem, pick a problem to which you know the solution, right. Pick a problem to which you know the solution, you anticipate the nature of the solution, what are the difficulties that are there. So you think about it a little, then say okay, this is going to give me a problem, let me pick something that is near Mach 0.5, okay, right. We could have done supersonic flow also, I could have done Mach 2. You have to ask the question why did not he do Mach 2, why did he not do Mach 2, why did he do say Mach 0.5, okay, is that fine. So there are, there are, then uh, you can, you can fiddle around with this just to figure out how, how the code behaves and see, see what happens, am I making sense for various values of normally, normally your experience, uh, my suggestion, uh, you, you, you may do this everything is in dimensional form, normally what you should do is you should non-dimensionalize the equation, okay. So normally whether you do it now, whether you implement it this way and then later non-dimensionalize the equations is up to you. So do use the non-dimensional form of the equations, okay. In your fluid mechanics you would have study a non-dimensionalization and why you should look at the non-dimensional form of the equations. My suggestion is to look at the non-dimensional form of the equations. But we can come back here, you can ask yourself the question if I take 1 meter or if I take 0.1 meters, does it make a difference? When does it make a difference? What is the, when is it the same, when is it different, okay. We are dealing with Euler equations and that can create some element of confusion, fine. Once you have this, this is a relatively uh, see I have shown you all the features that you can get right in the, in the demo, not much that you can get beyond that, right. You can get into trouble, you can try out various things, combinations that I have told you and you can get into trouble. Really in gas dynamics this is not what we st study, right. You do 1D, 1D equations, you set up the 1D equations, but the interesting stuff when you go to, comes when you go to quasi 1D, you, two dimensions is tough, you go to quasi 1D or you do go to two dimensions steady state, right. Okay, quasi 1D steady state. So I am going to draw, I will draw half of it, shall I draw the other half also, 
something like that. This is a typical nozzle that you are used to dealing with. How did quasi 1D flow go? So you have some area variation. So the area variation this could be the x direction. The area variation could be some s of x, s of x, s as a function of x and the corresponding governing equations, the equations corresponding governing equations corresponding to this would be I will write it out you can verify it right you can you can go back and check whether so dou by dou t of q times s just make sure I am using the same s plus dou by dou x of e times s equals no the right hand side is not 0 okay simply because I have taken this s inside the brackets there I get an extra term on the right hand side I can place an h the h is 0 p ds dx 0 You can do a simple sanity check right now. I would suggest that you make sure that you are able to remember what I told you earlier, right? Make sure you are able to derive the equations. I may have made a mistake. But when someone is writing this, you should be sitting there doing a simple sanity check. So when s is a constant, that goes to 0. And it can be factored out, you get back your 1D. So in that sense, yes, it is a superset, right? But as to whether the actual terms, individual terms are okay, right? Is something that you have to look at. So this is not really that much of a change from your one dimensional from a one dimensional solver right it is really not that much of a change but now interesting things can happen the flow field is more interesting right now interesting things can happen the flow field is much more interesting so you could choose again prescribe p0 and t0 here and prescribe a p ambient here and try out different things try out different combinations right you could have subsonic subsonic throat choked throat not choked right so I would start with subsonic, subsonic, throat not choked. That's where I would start, and then slowly build build it up to where it's choked. Are you able to get the supersonic flow? Right? Are you able to get the supersonic branch? This is all for a small s, an s of, for a given s of x. Then you can try if I change the s of x. Right? Fine. If you want to keep it simple, remember what I said. Always try to keep it simple. So I would not even do this first, what would you what would you do first? I would just use a I would just do a small converging duct, right? Instead of a constant area duct, I would actually do a small converging duct. So the S of X is known, S of X is simple, right? So S of X is a linear of, is a is a linearly decreasing function. S of X is known, prescribe the P naught and T naught here prescribe p ambient here in fact you can take the same values that are there see what happens okay is that fine right you can then do I would most probably do then a diverging section and then maybe a CD nozzle at that time right always good to go through a hierarchy of problems instead of jumping into the big problem directly is that fine okay are there any questions Okay, I think this is uh, as I said you have spent quite a bit of time in gas dynamics on uh, quasi 1D flow so I am not going to go through all the assumptions uh, right you would expect that uh, if S was varying very rapidly you would expect that there would be issues there should be problems right. So because it is quasi one dimensional the assumption is the area variations are not very rapid right otherwise the other two dimensional three dimensional effects will come to play okay. Fine. So I will. I will uh, now. What I do is, I go back to that equation. I'm going to rewrite this. I get back to. I'm going to get back to accelerating convergence. And there's a whole class of schemes. There's a whole class of schemes that we are going to look at. Okay. If I look at this, this looks like 
some matrix multiplying some vector equals the right hand side that's the residue instead of using this to start with i am going to start I'm, i will start with laplace's equation okay i will start with laplace's equation so i'm going to start with laplace's equation as an example and we'll try to reason out i'm going to follow a certain path but i want to recollect some of the things that i've done in the uh, uh, previous classes the previous demos uh, more important and conclusions that we've drawn in the demos which are going to which i'm going to use to rationalize or base right this acceleration scheme fine so first think back to representing functions using hat functions right we tried representing sin x sin n x and we had drew the following conclusions so the conclusions were there is a highest frequency that can be represented on on a given grid so there is a And remember we are always talking about a uniform grid for these discussions we are always talking about uniform grid I do not want to even get to non-uniform grid right now there is there is a highest frequency that can be represented on a given grid right what else is there anything else. So a variation of that I turned the statement around so whether a given wave number highest frequency wave number normally when we, they say frequency when you are talking about time right okay wave number wave number okay I will turn it around for a given wave number whether it is a high wave number or low wave number high frequency or low frequency depends on the grid on which you are representing it taking the same thing and right which is also important for me. So uh, whether a given wave number is high or low depends on the underlying grid I want both these right though they are variations of each other I want both of these what else do we know now that I have defined what is high and low we go to a different demo that we did we go to a different demo that we did and we basically said that if you have these if the scheme is dissipative in some sense it seems to show that high frequencies decay faster than low frequencies fine so certain schemes high wave numbers I am saying frequencies again I put the quote on high so now I have mentioned I have told you what are high and low that was the reason why I needed that okay. So high is with respect to the grid, low is with respect to the grid. So the grid is now become going to become important, the underlying grid is very important. So if you say high wave numbers decay faster than low wave numbers which means that by changing the grid it is possible for me to change whether a frequency is high or low that is the clue okay that is the clue. So we come up with this idea that we will use multiple grids, the scheme is called a multi-grid scheme. not a scheme to solve a problem it is a scheme to accelerate a solution technique okay multi grid scheme the idea is to use multiple grids right so I, I just take if I think about one dimensional Laplace's equation which is looks something like that right which you basically know on three grid points I am not even going to bother to derive it you already know 
these are p p plus 1 p minus 1 then you know that given given those two right you already know that u p at iteration level n plus 1 or q plus 1 is the average of the adjacent points. So just a quick quick example as to why how this happens. So if I have if this is what I am plotting now is the what I am plotting now is an error okay what I am plotting now is an error if I have so I want or uh, if the end points are 0 then the solution should go to 0 either way right. If I have my initial guess as something that is this way we have seen this I am only reproducing what we did in the demo but I want to do it in a very specific fashion. So if you have a grid point at this trough you have a grid point at this peak you have a grid point at this trough and if these correspond to p minus 1 and p plus 1 you can see looking at these three that the average will give me something that is going to go that way that is basically what the averaging is going to do is that fine everyone. So these three grid points are indeed effective in eliminating that little, little high frequency and if you iterate once or twice that high frequency will go away and what you will be left with. The high frequency will go away and what will you be left with? You will be left with the low frequency. Let us look at those three grid points again that is p, p minus 1, p plus 1. And if you look at it this, this and this the average is very close the changes that you are going to get with this grid are going to be very small okay. On the other hand if instead of that you had a grid point here, a grid point here and a grid point there now you can see that if you take the average the change is much larger right or even go make it even more even make it even more coarser if you had a grid point here a grid point here and a grid point there you understand it's the change is extremely drastic but the tragedy is that though the change is drastic though the change is drastic the grid on which that you are able to do that is a very coarse grid right so somehow we have to come up with a mechanism by way which we use we get the solution on the fine grid but we use the coarse grids to eliminate the error the low frequency error the error that is low frequency on the fine grid we want to use a coarse grid to eliminate it the error which has low frequency on the fine grid we want to use a coarse grid on which that error will be a high frequency we want to use that coarse grid to eliminate that error is that fine okay that is the motivation that is what we are trying to do this is called this is called the multi a multi grid scheme so we will see how we would do it okay. So back here Laplace's equation Laplace's equation we know if we were to discretize Laplace's equation get a similar setup I am not going to deal with this right so I know A is a flux Jacobian but you humor me and allow allow A to be the coefficient matrix so Laplace's equation this is for Laplace's equation this is not the flux Jacobian right A times phi of h equals f of h I will put h there where h is the h represents the grid size see I already write the thing a little differently because I am saying that I am going to use multiple grids I am aware that I am going to use multiple grids 
right. So now I am being very careful, right up front I am going to be careful, I am going to say wait a minute, if I am going to use multiple grids I am liable to get confused. So let me stick H's up there so that I get the, uh, I, I can keep track of where I am, okay. Go back, if you go back to the part that we did Laplace's equation, you, you will see that we can actually write it this way. In 1D it would be, this would be a tridiagonal matrix, in 2D it is going to be a matrix whose bandwidth is much, much larger, okay. We have done this before, you can write it in this form, fine. The original equation is nabla squared phi equals 0, okay. If you get this exactly, if you get this exactly, then phi minus phi h will be a representation error, fine, right. So we solve this in some fashion, we will solve in this, we can solve this in some fashion. You could guess a phi, you could guess a capital phi, right, you could guess some, you can guess a phi, a candidate solution for this, right. Am I making sense? Phi h is what you are seeking. If you have phi h, you have the representation, you have the answer, you have the value at the nodes. Okay, you do not have this, you only have a representation of that on the computer. So if you have this, you have the solution. If you guess something which has an error in it, I will make it capital phi, you could guess that, okay. And in order to, in order to get to where I want to go, since I already know where I am headed, right. I am going to do this in steps. I am going to define an eh which is an error which is the phi h which I seek minus capital phi h which I have guessed. Is that fine everyone? Okay. Right. I will also define the residue rh as f h minus a h phi h. Is that fine? Okay. So what am I going to do? I am going to multiply this by, I am going to multiply that by AH. So I get AH EH equals AH PH minus AH PH. I have not done any linearization and going from really the original equations are linear. But it helps that the equation, the system of equations is linear, right. So I am using that fact here, it distributes over. And this AH, FH is, this I have a small error here. For a minute I was staring at it saying, wait a minute, there is something wrong. <laughs> if I have the solution, the residue has to be 0, right. If I have the solution, the residue has to be 0. For a minute I was staring at it saying, what is wrong, there is something wrong, <laughs> okay, fine. So what does this give me? This gives me FH minus that which is RH. So you get AH, EH equals Rh, okay. This equation incidentally is called the correction equation. The equation is called the correction equation.
and in fact you can use this equation to solve the problem instead of the original equation instead of using instead of this instead of using this you can actually use this to solve the problem am i making sense how would you do that you would guess a you would guess a guess a ph guess a capital ph compute rh solve for eh some iterative fashion maybe you don't have to solve it solve it right you don't have to use a direct method but get an estimate for this so find an eh from then upgrade update your ph new and then you can iterate you can do this iteratively am i making sense so you could in, in theory you could use this this equation it's a little contrived it looks a little contrived right but i just want to show it is equivalent to solving the original equation solving for this correction is equivalent to solving the original equation is that fine everyone okay now we go one step further so i can iterate i can use either gauss seidel or something of that sort you can imagine that i do i do this i find this i do one sweep of gauss seidel i sweep through once with gauss seidel calculate the new one go back here find the new r one sweep of gauss seidel and you keep on repeating that process okay so you can set up an iterative scheme right you can use either gauss jord gauss jacobi iteration or gauss seidel or something of that sort you can set up an iterative scheme fine so you are going through these iterations you are going through these iterations you do 10 iterations it seems you are converging very nicely all the high frequencies are gone and now you are stuck with the low frequency terms right you have taken a 101 by 101 grid and you are iterating away right and it is not going because the low frequency take terms take a long time so the question is wouldn't it be nice if I could solve this problem now on a coarser grid so that that low frequency would turn out to be a high frequency on the new grid okay so we do a small wrinkle what we do is we take the same thing here we take the same thing there but we add a wrinkle so we say we have the ph find the rh okay or let me let me write the so iterate a h p h equals f h few times so to indicate that i am iterating at a few times i'll draw an arrow this way and say iterate how many times you want to do it okay iterate it some n times so you already have a disposable parameter it could be 5 times 10 times you have to figure out what's good right iterate n times calculate rh equals fh minus ah ph so this is our current estimate after n iterations what comes out of this is capital ph that's what comes out of that now in some fashion transfer rh to r2h i don't want to call it r2h so i well r2h you need i have to there is an extra step be careful with this part i'm going to come back and erase it and make some changes transfer from r to r2h okay rh to r2h you understand what i mean so if you say wait a minute how do i transfer what how does this magic occur we will see it in one dimension right 
So I, these are the grid points that I have one dimension I will keep it coarse so that we are able to and let me get some colored chalk. So if I have a value here I have a value at these points so this is H 2H would be this okay. So to find the value here to find the value at this point to transfer the simplest way to do is just throw that away that is the simplest way to do it just ignore these points just throw those two away take the one that is there simplest way to do it. You do not like it oh I slogged so much on all those adjacent points should I really throw it away this is what you feel you feel regret then do a little work right take a weighted average one of this one of that two of those divide by 4 right you understand what I am saying. So 2 phi p phi p minus 1 phi p plus 1 by 4 right and these are all capital fees okay this is phi of course it should be r I should actually be transferring r right it is not really phi it should be r let me correct that 2rp rp minus 1 rp plus 1 by 4 all of these at h this is okay so now you have a way by which you can get r at 2h am I making sense at the point p fine transfer from rh to r to h back here iterate this n times get a candidate fee find the residue transfer the residue okay then what on that coarse grid solve a to h e to h equals r to h when I say solve I mean iterate a few times. iterate a few times iterate to get e to h okay transfer e to h to e h that should not be difficult is not it that should not be you can interpolate using the same example if you want the value here you can interpolate right you can interpolate you can always get the value in between then repeat the correction update transfer it back pH nu equals pH plus eh that you have transferred okay in fact instead of what you can do is you can do this and just to be sure that you have everything on the h grid fine before you say I have the solution you can iterate ah ph equals fh a few more times just to make sure you have a solution on that fine fine grid fine everybody is okay you transfer to a coarse grid and transfer it back now comes the little trick that we are going to do okay now comes the little gimmick that we are going to play come back here you are here you have done the transfer okay you have done the transfer having done the transfer come back here and I am starting to iterate right you are working on a 50 by 50 grid you are doing iterations you do 10, 10 iterations all the high frequency errors on that 50 by 50 grid disappear but it still does not converge because on that grid there are low frequency errors that that grid cannot converge that rapidly that though there are low frequency errors on that grid that do not go away. So you think if only I could run them on a 25 by 25 grid right and you can you can 
if you just change the notation a little okay so if you guys don't mind we'll go back here change the notation a little you change this to f to h transfer r h we'll call it change it to f to h if you change it to f to h what happens to this equation that says a h e to h equals f to h that looks very suspiciously like the original equation which we are trying to solve which is a h phi h equals f to h f h okay. So what you need to do is you iterate this another n times or m times or whatever it is. n1 times or n2 n times whatever to get this to get this and do not transfer it back instead calculate r to h now you understand why I wanted to call this f to h because I propose to define a residue at this level calculate r to h which is f to h minus a to h e to h. transfer r to h to r 4 h okay r 4 h you could in theory transfer it to any size that you wanted but it is a little easier if you keep them if you keep the relationship transfer r to h to r 4 h iterate a 4 h e 4 h equals oops made a mistake transfer r 2 h to f 4 h cannot fall into the now first time it is okay second time we cannot make that mistake now we know the game r 2 h has to go to f 4 h iterate this how many levels do we want to go well that depends on where you started if you started with 1023 grids or something a huge number huge size 1000 by 1000 grids right and clearly there is some relationship to powers of 2 so you have to look at what is that relationship okay I will let you figure that out. So then you can keep on having the grid keep on having the grid right till you get to a point where you are happy with what what you have the convergence rate that you have fine okay oops okay that is fine what I will do is we will get back to this I will uh, we will we will talk about maybe a little of this multigrid thing in the next class okay fine thank you.